I'm J. David Miller, and today on George Fox Talks, we're going to be discussing the life of William Hobson, who helps us better understand American Quakerism in the 19th century, Newburgh, Oregon, and some of the background to George Fox University. All right, welcome to this episode of George Fox Talks Culture. I'm Jay Miller, and today I'm joined by Julie Anderson. Julie is an alumna of George Fox University, a longtime member of Newburgh Friends Church here in town, and currently the congregational care pastor there. Julie's also an author of the recently published book, William Hobson, who lived from 1820 to 1891, and the subtitle is Pioneer, Minister, and Founder of the Evangelical Friends Church in the Pacific Northwest. One of the reasons I wanted to have Julie on is because we're going to be doing um, on the George Fox Talks Culture Channel several episodes about Quakerism um, because George Fox University is founded as a Quaker institution, has an official relationship with Northwest Yearly Meeting and Evangelical Friends Yearly Meeting, and we want to understand that background a little bit and help our audience understand that. So um, if there are things you didn't understand even about my introduction, we're going to get into that and talk about that. Um, but essentially, William Hobson is seen by many as the founder of Quakerism in Newburgh, or kind of one of the most important figures of that, um, and did that in the late 19th century. And I want to open up just by telling an anecdote I learned growing up in Newburgh about William Hobson mm -hmm. um, that usually involved William Hobson moving out here to Newburgh when it was much less developed, working on a farm. And as the story goes, William Hobson climbed Shehala Mountain one day. And um, from the top of that mountain, he had something of a visionary experience where he looked out on this valley and it was you know, not a very populated valley at the time, but imagined it having rail connections, commerce, successful farms, a thriving friends community, a Quaker college. And he imagined it being like a garden of the Lord is kind of the actual phrasing that was often picked up and is also the title of a history of North this yearly meeting that touches a lot on Newburgh. So um, that's the story I grew up her hearing about William Hobson. And I was really interested to learn from Julie's book that it might have actually been a little bit different. So Julie, I wonder if we could start by just telling us a little bit about how you've thought about that anecdote and what you learned about it in your research. Sure. Um, from studying his diary, uh, I noticed that he used that phrase, a garden of the Lord, but he used it in an entry uh, that did not involve a trek up Shehala Mountain. He was uh, working uh, that day on two things, writing a letter to some family members in the morning, and then later in the day, he did some uh, work around his farmyard. And so he actually uh, did not write down or say anything about going to the top of Shehila Mountain uh, in any of his diary entries. Now, he may have, and this could be an oral tradition, but it seems more likely that he was so involved in developing his uh, orchard and his land that he did not really have time to trek up Shehala Mountain. Uh, there were, uh, around a time that he uses this phrase, Garden of the Lord, there were some uh, friends visiting with him who did take a trip up to the top of Shehala Mountain and back down again, and they told him of their experience. And it mm. seems that uh, he would have said that he accompanied them or... Uh, some way shown that he had climbed the mountain. Uh, I believe that the origin of this anecdote is from a paper written by uh, William Rees in the early 1900s, in which he juxtaposes this phrase, Garden of the Lord, with um, a, a uh, another section of Hobson's diary that makes it seem as though he had mm. this vision from the top of Shehala Mountain, mm -hmm. and that previous accounts, uh, this repeating of this anecdote came from that source. Yeah, so it's it's a 
potentially, uh, you know, it may be hard to know definitively for sure. We know it's not mentioned in the diary in the way that the oral tradition remembers it, but potentially right. the kind of the visionary moment Hobson has on top of the mountain is <laughs> uh, early 19th century kind of retelling of, uh, or early 20th century retelling yes. of a late 19th century sort of moment. What's yes. what's this for you, Julie? What's the significance of thinking about that moment and Hobson envisioning this valley as a garden of the Lord in a slightly different way? Why does mm -hmm. that matter? Well, for him, a uh, garden of the Lord. So he spent uh, most of his adult life in horticulture and mm. agriculture. He especially loved horticulture the growing of fruit, um, and peaches were his favorite fruit, but he grew apples and pears. Uh, he was a hard worker. Um, he was working there in the valley, so to speak, uh, building something. And so his vision was much more, I think, in the nitty gritty. Mm. And, and while he would be, I think, very much in tune with the vision as it's stated in the anecdote that he would like to see a prosperous valley with a school and a and a strong Quaker presence um, that that he would be more along the lines of working hard for that mm -hmm. as opposed to um, more of a pie in the sky kind of a vision. Yeah. Whether or not someone's interested in William Hobson as a person or even Quakerism in Newburgh and the way Quakerism connects to George Fox, um, Hobson's a great figure for thinking about just the nitty gritty of 19th century American Quakerism, which in some ways I think is, if not maybe – it's hard to pick a century, but it's in some ways the most consequential century for Quakerism, just because so much happens and there's so much transformation. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to get into all of that in this podcast episode, but Julie, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about how you came to Hobson, how you got interested in him, and how you came to write this book based on your research into his writings. Yes. So back in the 1990s, I worked in the library here at George Fox University. And uh, I worked in the back of the library in what's called technical services, where you process books and catalog books and put labels on and, and I guess do the nitty gritty mm -hmm. of library work. And I came across, as I was going through some materials, uh, a notebook, kind of like a composition notebook that you would write a uh, test in in the old days. Uh, and I, I found this notebook on the shelf, and I thought, what is this? And I opened it up and written in pencil or possibly really faded ink. It said, William Hobson, Memorandum, 1876. And then began to outline uh, in brief, in a kind of nutshell, his trip from uh, North Carolina to Iowa to Oregon and and then there were notes all throughout this notebook that he had written. And I went, Wow you know, what is this doing on the shelf? This original source document from 1876 mm -hmm. written in William Hobson's handwriting. Now, at the time, I didn't know a whole lot about him. All I knew was that he was considered to be the founder of uh, Northwest Yearly Meeting of Friends. And I thought, this is pretty important. So I took it to my boss, who was Charlie Camilos at the time. And uh, Charlie eventually got it into the archives at George Fox. Um, several years down the road, uh, I transcribed that memorandum. And in the process of transcribing that, I found out that in the archives at George Fox uh, was William Hobson's diary on microfilm. And that had been microfilm back in the 1960s by a man named Edward Thatcher. Mm. And so then I began to transcribe his diaries from the microfilm. And that was a wonderful process. It took me a long time. And in the middle of that process, I felt like God was calling me to write a book about William Hobson. Mm. So I began to do research on all kinds of secondary sources. And how much work had been done on Hobson? How much secondary work was there at the time you started in the mid-90s, you said? Yeah, in the mid-90s. So back in the 1960s, uh, Myron D. Goldsmith did his dissertation for Boston University on William Hobson. And uh, 
So that was a great source for me. And he would go on to be a faculty member at George Fox. Yes, he would. Yes, and a member at Newburgh Friends Church. Okay. Uh, so Goldsmith's work was wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent research, top-notch you know, top-notch uh, information there. And so I used that as a secondary source for sure. And then I also, uh, I found some information about William Hobson in some periodicals and some things, some mm -hmm. short articles. Mm -hmm. uh, also looked at source documents like his obituary, um, some other things in the Newberg graphic that were helpful. Uh, all kinds of other friends' history material mm -hmm. that would put him in his setting. in And so secondary sources were also very useful, but the main source was his diary okay. and the memorandum. Mm -hmm. And so you started writing the book and digging the secondary research as you were transcribing the diary. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how did so you started that in the 1990s? Mm -hmm. This was just published in the in 2021. Yeah. So what, um, <laughs> tell us a little bit more about the journey to publication. So or the research process. Yeah. So I first found that memorandum on the shelf. Uh, you know, I guess that was two decades ago. Um, life kind of got in the way. We had two children, um, two girls in the midst of that. And so I I wrote and researched in between raising them. And uh, it was an activity that kept my brain active yeah. <laughs> in the midst of, mm -hmm. of babies and young children. And uh, so that it took me a long time because I wasn't um, singularly focused on writing this book. Mm -hmm. So, um, Well, you, I've, I really enjoyed reading it both as someone who grew up in Newburgh and, you know, around a lot of the institutions, whether that's Northwest Yearly Meeting, which is the, for listeners who may not know, a yearly meeting is kind of the broadest kind of regional organization of friends. Sometimes it's a national organization, depending on where you're at in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just kind of like yearly meeting just refers to the fact that that group meets annually to kind of do business and worship together. And so um, this is a fascinating read for me from those directions, but also as a scholar of Quakerism um, there and someone who focuses on earlier periods like the 17th and 18th century, I really learned a lot about 19th century Quakerism here that um, I found really compelling. And um, yeah, I think, again, one of the things that's compelling about Hobson is just that he's not in just interesting for people local to Newburgh or local to Northwest Yearly Meeting or local to George Fox, but that um, he's really an amazing figure in that he lived – from 1820 to 1891, that really spans the 19th century. He spanned some, he grew up in North Carolina yeah. and eventually dies on the West Coast. So he spans the continent. He also lives through um, several sort of Quaker schisms and divisions. And he kind mm -hmm. of is interesting in terms of where he falls theologically on that map. And so yeah. I, I wonder if we could get into all that now. Sure. Um and I wonder if we might start before diving into him a little bit and where he fits into just talking a little bit more about that 19th century Quakerism. So um, in brief, Julia, and we can we can follow up and develop things. Can you talk about what happened to American Quakerism in the 19th century, um, starting sort of at the beginning and toward, you know, the end of when Hobson is alive? Sure, sure. So, um <clears throat> Before Hobson, for a number of years, there was what we call quietism. So friends had sunk down into this uh, waiting before the Lord, and meetings were all unprogrammed, all across Quakerism. Which is to say they were often, they were kind of the most traditional form of Quaker worship, that they'd be sitting in silence, waiting on inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That um, Yes, Friends had practiced from the beginning, but in the beginning, they were more charismatic. Yes. And during this quietest phase you're talking about, they become more staid mm -hmm. and reserved. Right. They become more staid, more reserved. Uh, there's less vocal ministry during unprogrammed worship. And uh, there's a de-emphasis on reading scripture. Uh, not completely, mm -hmm. but overall. So when we enter into the 1800s, the early 1800s, um, there are two streams beginning to develop. Those that want to remain unprogrammed and 
stay um, less centered on scripture. And those that are beginning to turn more towards scripture and become more evangelical in their in their um, in their thought processes. They haven't moved yet from unprogrammed worship, mm-hmm. but they are moving more towards a evangelical viewpoint. And this is in the context of the Second Great Awakening in the early 19th century, yes. too. So it's kind of they're thinking about their relationship to the broader kind of Christian community in the United States. Yeah, although they did not embrace that first Great Awakening. Right, in the 18th century. In the 18th century, right. yeah. So they're beginning to they're beginning to diverge. So in the late in 1827, 28, 29, there's what we call the Hicksite separation. And I don't know that we need to go into those details completely, but but basically what happened was that there was a break between all of well, most of the yearly meetings in America. They separated over the authority of Scripture, and and some wanted to go the more evangelical route, and others wanted to remain in that unprogrammed uh, space with de-emphasizing Scripture. Mm-hmm. It's also a little about Christology as yes, well. Yes, um, definitely. In, you know. At the time, the kind of the orthodox group of friends is sort of emphasizing a more conditional, uh, traditional kind of concept of Jesus as um, both divine and human. Yep. Um, whereas kind of <clears throat> Hicksite Quakers, which, you know, is, you know, attributed to Elias Hicks um, and his leadership is less focused on that sort of traditional emphasis. Not that all Hicksite yeah. Quakers agreed with everything exactly. Hicks taught, but that's a general kind of. <laughs> summary of that division. Yeah. Yeah. So what we would call the Orthodox are going to believe in the atonement, are going to believe in sanctification, some even going as far as to say they believe in a second work of grace. Mm -hmm. The Hicksite friends are going to devalue the atonement. They are going to be more um, universalist in their ideas about Mm -hmm. God and um, definitely would devalue scripture in in a sense. And a stronger emphasis on Christ within as the presence yeah. teacher, less of an emphasis on a historical, on the continuity between a present experience of Christ and that being in continuity with a historical right. kind of relationship of Christ. Right. Yeah. Well, Orthodox friends would accuse the Excite friends of of the inner light uh, losing its tether mm-hmm. to the Holy Spirit or to Christ or mm-hmm. God within. And Hicksite friends would accuse the Orthodox friends of being um, less Quaker and perhaps being creaturely, mm-hmm. you know, like running ahead of God. Mm-hmm. In, in, so so there were accusations flying yeah. always. So that's the first major separation yes. um, that happens at the beginning of the 19th century. And um, Hobson definitely kind of falls on the orthodox side of that. Absolutely. But there are also orthodox divisions later on in the 19th century. Can you say a little bit about that and how those are relevant to understanding who Hobson is and what his sensibilities are? Sure, sure. Um, So North Carolina Yearly Meeting, where Hobson grew up, Mm -hmm. was a thoroughly orthodox meeting. It did not separate. The entire yearly meeting uh, was... Gurneyite. Mm -hmm. So John Joseph Gurney was a prominent um, evangelical friend. And so he grew up in that environment and he remained a a Gurneyite Orthodox friend his whole life long. He, when he went to Iowa, uh, he, he definitely um, embraced scripture reading. You can tell that from his diary. Mm -hmm. He has scripture references. Uh, He, he knew the Bible. Also, uh, he started Sunday school, what we would call Sunday school. He called it first day school. All friends did then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that was also a hallmark of Gurneyite uh, Orthodox friends. Mm-hmm. Now, as we progress, um, say, 1850s, 60s, the, the Orthodox Gurneyite friends began to separate over not theology, but practice. Mm. 
So they were united in the evangelical theology of the atonement and sanctification and et cetera, et cetera. But they began to separate over how to worship. So many of the evangelical Gurneyite friends were embracing more what they called worship innovations, uh, many of which were borrowed from the Methodist tradition and some other evangelical traditions, mm -hmm. including things like altar calls, uh, music in mm -hmm. worship, uh, the mourner's bench, uh, other kinds of innovations. Whereas other friends that were still orthodox in their theology wanted to remain unprogrammed. And so we get a separation called the Wilburite Gurneyite separation. So the Gurneyites were embracing these worship innovations and the Wilburites were saying, no, we'd like to remain unprogrammed. Mm -hmm. And so two strains within the orthodox camp then emerged and some meetings split right down the center, some yearly meetings split. Um, the most of them went with the Gurneyite tradition, mm -hmm. but many went with the Wilbright tradition. And so you had parallel yearly meetings in some places, mm -hmm. conservative yearly meetings, the Wilburites, and mm -hmm. then the Orthodox Gurneyite meetings. Yeah. In the book, one of the ways you distinguish it helpfully, I think, is thinking about certain Quakers um, in this Orthodox stream thought of themselves as as seeking renewal. So mm -hmm. saying our practices are fine. We just need to renew them and make sure we're doing them right. Correct. And then this is kind of all we need. This will work. We just need to focus on doing it. Yep. Whereas revivalist friends, actually, they're kind of anti-traditionalist in a certain way. They think yep. this is old fashioned or not necessary or not effective enough. Mm -hmm. And so they want to innovate and change and are willing to kind of let go of parts of the tradition um, to fulfill their purpose of evangelizing or just kind of church revival yeah. and kind of seeking renewal in that way. Um, mm -hmm. So all of this is happening over the course of Hobson's lifetime. How would you characterize sort of where he falls within mm -hmm. um, relationship to those broad trends? So Hobson was more of a renewal friend. He was always more comfortable with unprogrammed worship. However, he really liked the results that the revival friends were getting. Mm -hmm. He was happy to see people coming to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. And he, while he himself was uncomfortable with some of those newer worship innovations, uh, he, he was happy to see uh, how many people were being drawn to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so he had a kind of internal tension, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, he felt the most comfortable in uh, unprogrammed worship, but many of his friends and contemporaries, especially in Iowa Yearly Meeting, mm -hmm. were more on the revival side. And so he was willing to uh, set aside his own uh, uncomfortable feelings about some of these um, innovations and participate uh, with the revival because he liked what the results were coming out of mm -hmm. uh, what 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 results were coming out of those. Revivals. Yeah, I think those tensions in Hobson are some of the most interesting things about him because in some ways yes. he is an outlier yes. compared to his peers. Um, so it's interesting to think about him being an outlier, but also being a founder yes. to a certain extent. And so we'll come back to those tensions, I think, and how they played out in Newburgh and in the Northwest. Yeah. Um, in a little bit, but could you just say a little bit about how he grows up in North Carolina, he moves and lives a lot of his adult life in Iowa, mm -hmm. um, and really kind of coming out to Newburgh and gathering a Quaker community here was kind of his last act yep. in a certain way. Yep. Um, could you say a little bit more about how he was drawn out here how and what establishing you know, himself in Newburgh was like? Sure. So he and his wife, Sarah, were... Um, in Iowa for about two decades. And when they first moved out of North Carolina to the big river area of Iowa, there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. It was raw wilderness. They built a homestead from scratch, totally from scratch. And they built it up into a very prosperous orchard mm 
and farm and homestead. Um, it was a, a wonderful place to be. They had friends. He was the minister at the Friends Church, which he didn't quite start, but was pretty close mm -hmm. in starting. And so they had it good. And God called him at about age 50 uh, to, to form a friend settlement on the West Coast somewhere. And he didn't have a clear picture of where that might be. He had family living in San Jose, and so he used that as a base mm -hmm. to travel uh, up and down the West Coast to try to figure out uh, where was God calling him. And uh, the first time that he came out to the West Coast, he kind of lost heart. Mm. And he went back to Iowa, and he didn't even talk about the Northwest for quite some time in his diary. But it wouldn't let him go. You know, God wouldn't let him go. Mm -hmm. And he wrestled with that calling until finally he had to say, yes, I will do it. And so he came out a second time. And through a series of events and, and the providence of God, uh, he decided to settle here in Newburgh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit, you know, this is another interesting way that your your book complicated some of my ideas about what who William Hobson was and how he founded Newburgh. Because mm -hmm. I think I grew up sort of with the sense of maybe he was the first Quaker to come mm -hmm. out here and then he started all, but he actually came into a pre-existing situation with a, with a a nascent sort of Quaker community. Yes. Could you say a little bit about what Quaker presence was already here in the, if not Newburgh, the sort of North Willamette Valley that um, – Newburgh lies in. Sure. Well, there were, in general, there were a couple waves of settlers. So mm -hmm. there were settlers that came in like 1845, 50, and then some that came in a, a decade later. And then he would be in a third wave mm -hmm. of settlers. So he was actually coming into an area that had previously been cultivated and somewhat loosely settled. There were... Um, this is a little hard to to get out of the research, but there were a few Quaker families actually in Newburgh on the west side, the Hagies, and there was another family too that mm -hmm. is in the book. I just can't pull the name out right now. And so it seems that they had settled a little bit, but they hadn't formed a meeting. Mm-hmm. Then closer to the time that Hobson came, there was a small group of friends in Dayton, and that was kind of the center of Quaker activity, uh, Dayton, and then also a little in Salem. Mm. But there was a family called the Whites, and uh, Rebecca Clausen was uh, the mother-in-law of, <laughs> of uh, the Whites. And then John Fusen and a couple other friends that mm -hmm. were actually meeting. And Rebecca Clausen was a minister, mm -hmm. and she was leading the meetings in Dayton. Okay. She also led some meetings in Salem. Um, so Hobson came into uh, an, the area, and he, he used Dayton a little bit as a base before he started meetings in Newburgh. Mm -hmm. He would come and go from Newburgh to Dayton. So that's an eight mile walk. Mm -hmm. And so he finally got fed up, I think, with walking 16 miles mm. to meeting and decided to start uh, a meeting in Newburgh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, you mentioned, um, was it Rebecca Clausen? Yes. There's also Rebe Rebecca Lewis. Was that, yes. were there two Rebeccas? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. That was fascinating to learn about. Um, Quaker women who had been out here prior and kind of in some ways laying the groundwork or planting seeds. Yes. Or, I mean, is that the right way to see it? Did you get the sense that as as Hobson sort of consolidates a Quaker community in Newburgh, was he was there ever any tension between that community in Dayton and the people who led in Dayton and Hobson? Or did that pretty naturally did their ministry here pretty naturally flow into what Hobson eventually started? Well, that's a good question. And since I don't have any source documents from Rebecca Clausen yeah. um, or Rebecca, Rebecca Lewis was more stationed in Portland okay, and, and did more along that. And, and at that time, 25 miles 
to Portland, mm -hmm. from Portland to Dayton, was a long way. Yes. So yeah. she she was more stationed out there. You would have traveled by there. river then, correct? Yeah, that was the primary exactly. way to get there. Down the Willamette. Uh, so Rebecca Clausen, I don't have any source records from her. I don't have mm -hmm. any writings or I can't, I don't know how she thought. But best I can tell, uh, Hobson came in and he organized uh, what was a loosely organized group of friends. Uh, he organized it into a uh, more of a established meeting. Mm -hmm. And it seems that Rebecca Clausen didn't mind too much because she and the friends from Dayton all became members at Newburgh Monthly Meeting. Mm -hmm. Which was initially Shahala Monthly Meeting, Shahala right? Monthly Meeting okay. was its first name. Okay. And so did Rebecca Lewis. Okay. She also became a member at Newburgh Monthly Meeting. So it seems to me that if there had been hard feelings, they would not have uh, joined Shahala Monthly Meeting. Uh, also, the, the focus shifted. Uh, many of the friends, although there weren't a huge amount, many mm -hmm. of the friends from Dayton moved to the Newburgh area. Okay. So that became the nucleus. So we can't say for sure. Sure. Maybe yeah. there were some hard feelings. I don't know, but yeah. I doubt it. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that if, if memberships are being transferred, you know, and, and this meeting kind of consolidates, that makes sense. And I'm not aware, you know, is, is Dayton on the Willamette River? Yes. It is. So they also had river access as well. So uh, it, it seemed, I think it seems right that, uh, Hobson was able to build on what was already here and that people generally seemed to gravitate toward shifting kind of the center of Quakerism here in the Willamette Valley from Dayton to Newburgh. Yes. Could you say a little bit about what then the initial beginnings of Shehala monthly meeting um, that would eventually become Newark Friends Church sure. was like kind of from initially? And then can we talk a little bit about what it was like around the time of Hobson's death and how he, those tensions between maybe renewal and revival manifest again toward the end of his life. Sure. Yeah. So Shahilla Monthly Meeting was started in 1876. They began by meeting in homes and then they built uh, what was a uh, Fondly called the old shack, right? The moss covered shack. <laughs> the Is moss that right? covered what I remember? shack. Yeah. Yes. The I, old... There's still a few moss covered shacks around here. Yeah, there you are. Around. <laughs> so the that was a, a fond reference because revival broke out 1878. Spontaneous revival. It began among the young people and the older folks, including William Hobson, were unsure at first, but mm. then they joined in. Mm -hmm. And the church grew exponentially. Um, over time, it uh, continued to grow, and not just by adding uh, members from the friends that moved out here, but mm -hmm. also by bringing in new converts. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time um, Hobson was getting closer to the end of his life, uh, a man named John Henry Douglas, who had been the superintendent of Iowa Yearly Meeting, came out and held a series of revival meetings, and that uh, grew the church uh, hugely. Uh, we're talking hundreds of people at one point mm -hmm. uh, joined uh, what would later be Newburgh Friends. Uh, Hobson, um, again, he still held that tension like he was happy that John Henry Douglas was uh, bringing people to Jesus, but he was unsure about the methods. Um, he had loosened a little bit uh, with music. Yeah, he was okay if somebody got up and sang a hymn mm -hmm. uh, during if worship. If it was spontaneous, if it was spontaneous, yes. but he still would have nothing to do with congregational singing. Yeah, hmm. because for more traditionalist friends. And I think you can still see this even among evangelical friends today in certain communities. Mm -hmm. There's maybe more of a suspicion of the way um, worship can sometimes be manipulative. Right. Or it can sometimes draw people into doing something that 
is not authentic or true right. to kind of what feels to them. So yeah, that's a that's an interesting interesting to see how he navigated that. Yeah, he was worried about people singing lies mm. in that perhaps they were singing words that didn't actually match their inward condition. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, and he rem- he remained uh, reserved about that mm-hmm. his his whole life long, but. Mm-hmm. But he had unbent enough by the end of his life to mm-hmm. allow someone to stand and sing if they uh, did it spontaneously in the spirit. Yeah. And another thing, too, that was innovative at the time was the, you know, this whole time we've been talking about ministers and things. But at the time, Quakers didn't, many Quakers didn't necessarily have a paid or official centralized pastoral ministry. And something else that changes. After Hobson dies, although mm-hmm. it's um, talked about while he's alive, is that yeah. um, Newberg Quakers Jehalem monthly meeting, Newberg friends meeting um, switches over to a pastoral system. That's right. What he called the pastoral system. That's right. It sounds kind of ominous when you call it the pastoral, the pastoral system. system. Yeah. So Iowa Yearly Meeting, a couple years before Hobson's death, had adopted the pastoral system mm-hmm. for the entire yearly meeting and new Merck friends was still a part of Iowa yearly meeting at that time. Mm-hmm. They were under their authority. They mm-hmm. had not yet become their own yearly meeting. And so part of the reason that John Henry Douglas came out and held revival meetings and such such was part of that also, that visit was to encourage Newburgh friends to get on board with mm-hmm. the rest of Iowa yearly meeting and call a pastor. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Hobson was uneasy with that too. He wanted to make sure that uh, everybody in the meeting uh, found their calling and used their spiritual gifts and was active in the work of the church. Mm-hmm. He didn't want people to rely on pastors to get the work of the church done. Mm-hmm. And so that was where his uneasiness lie, laid, you know, with the, with that. But he was willing to stand aside and or not stand aside. He was willing to unify with the body, uh, even though he had reservations. Mm-hmm. We haven't talked about education very much. I wonder if briefly <coughs> before we wrap up, what was um, what is now George Fox University was originally founded as Friends Pacific Academy in Well, yes. Is that right? The the names change a lot over time. Yes, they did. Um, But this was in 1891, right when he dies? Is that correct? Well, that was when it became Pacific College, if I'm recalling correctly. It began as Friends Pacific Academy earlier than that. It was a high school, basically. Okay. And then it it morphed into a college, Mm -hmm. and then it morphed into a university. Yeah, so even though <laughs> Hobson didn't have a hand in founding the kind of collegiate level, he did care a lot about education. Absolutely. Uh, his dad before him cared very much about education and was instrumental in improving the educational opportunities in North Carolina, and Hobson followed in his footsteps. He was trained at New Garden Boarding School as a teacher and he actually taught school a couple uh, times in his early days. When he was traveling, he would always uh, visit educational institutions, and they often asked him to give a speech or to uh, to talk about the Lord. Um, that, those were different times. Mm-hmm. He was able to give sermons in schools, actually, mm-hmm. quote-unquote sermons. And... Then he was, when he came to Oregon, he kept that, you know, interest in education. He visited Friends Pacific Academy a lot. Uh, Mm -hmm. The kids loved it when he came because he would bring a sack of apples. Mm -hmm. And uh, they called him Uncle Uncle William or Uncle Willie because he was just kind of a fixture in the school system. And not only Friends Pacific Academy, but also the public school in mm-hmm. Newburgh. He was very interested. Mm. And he had pledged money for George Fox University, but he died before he was able to actually fulfill his pledge. So had he lived, I'm sure he would have been a strong supporter mm-hmm. of the college. Yeah. As, as a way of wrapping up, I wonder if we could talk just a little bit about 
you know, assessing Hobson's legacy for us today. One of the things that I find so interesting about him is the fact, you know, how he's, you know, again, this outlier in some ways among his kind of more evangelical or more revivalist sort of peers Mm -hmm. um, and the way we can, he navigated, he felt tensions himself and tried to navigate that faithfully in his time. And Mm -hmm. thinking today about, George Fox University is an institution that has, you know, has 50% of its board members are friends. There's some mm-hmm. friends, students, and some friends, faculty, but the larger institution kind of um, serves evangelical kind of Christians and even, you know, mm-hmm. students who aren't Christians in that broader community. Mm-hmm. Um, so you kind of see those same kind of tensions and questions there, um, you know, and you see those kind of questions and tensions in Northwest Yearly Mini as well. So that's very interesting to me to think about Hobson as someone who felt tensions as we all do and tried to respond faithfully to them. Yes. I'm wondering you, Julie, as someone who's sat with Hobson for a long time, mm-hmm. I wonder if there are two Hobson legacies you could talk about. What do you think is his most important historical legacy? And then what do you think is Hobson's most important spiritual legacy? Sure. So historical legacy, um, he... He founded uh, Honey Creek Friends in Iowa, was faithful, faithfully served there for 20 years, and also uh, just helped to build infrastructure in Iowa by mm-hmm. building up his homestead. And he was faithful day in and day out to do the work that was necessary uh, to sustain his family and also the congregation mm-hmm. at Honey Creek. He did the same thing out here. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he was faithful to um, support himself. He, he was never paid for his ministry. Mm-hmm. He was faithful to support himself and his family through his work in horticulture and uh, on the farm. And he was faithful to his community and helped to build infrastructure here in Newburgh as well. Um, culturally speaking or historically speaking, um, Friends have had a big influence on Newburgh over the years. Mm -hmm. Uh, Newburgh was a dry town for, you know, up until the 1960s, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, uh, a friend owned the newspaper for decades, Ezra Woodward Mm -hmm. and others. So there there are lots of um, historical components to his faithfulness to God, uh, things that maybe would not have been uh, had he not said yes to God. Mm -hmm. And then broader, if you just kind of, in terms of his own spirituality, even, Mm -hmm. or kind of his spiritual ethos or even his spiritual vision, what do you, what do you take away from Hobson? I think the thing that drew me to him the most was his consistent obedience. And we know that uh, friends get their name from John 15, chapter John 15, where Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I Mm, command you. mm -hmm. And in that sense, he was a quintessential friend. He obeyed God from a very young age. Uh, As a child, he had a call to be a preacher, and he was worried that his fellow students would find that out Mm. and and, uh, call him out on that. Um, Some of the young students that he went to school with were not friends, but they still used the plain language with him because they recognized something in him Mm. that was different. Uh, He was obedient to God in so many ways as a young man growing up, and he was very concerned about his spiritual health and uh, about sin, uh, his own personal sin, and repenting of that. And he was unusual in that in his home, his parents had a Bible, and his mom actually taught him from it and his siblings. And so he had scriptural uh, understanding as well from a young age, Mm -hmm. which was not a usual thing for friends at that time. So he was set up for spiritual success in a way, Hmm. but he rose to the occasion himself, and he kept saying yes to God. So he said yes to God, you know, when he took on Honey Creek, um, in both the homesteading and also in the congregation there as a leader, as a minister. And then uh, this amazing midlife call. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 50. And so if God puts a call on me to go to, you know, I don't know, Ecuador, uh, (laughs) somewhere else uh, to 
to do his work, that would be a huge uprooting. Mm -hmm. And so I really resonate with that because he was so well established there at Honey Creek. And Mm -hmm. yet he said yes to God Mm -hmm. to do what God was calling him to do. And we have today the fruit of his yes. Uh, We have a thriving uh, yearly meeting. We have a thriving university. We have a spiritual legacy of being obedient to the Lord that is uh, just amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And so that's what really drew me to Hobson, Mm -hmm. was his willingness to be faithful to God and to say yes over and over again. Mm -hmm. And and what God did with his yeses is is, mm-hmm. is just wonderful. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to go back to that final kind of think about that final idea of the garden of the Lord and thinking about occurring maybe yes. not on a mountaintop, but in nitty context is like, yeah, he did great things, but he also felt uncomfortable in a lot of the situations he was in and yep. felt uncomfortable even with his own peers in some ways and what mm-hmm. they were trying to do. And um, we didn't talk about it much, but you know, it um was a challenging experience in his own marriage and with his wife, yes. Sarah, in terms of moving out here and the whole idea of uprooting. I think you're right. It's very challenging. So mm-hmm. I think Hobson is inspiring, not just in being visionary and, you know, we deem him being successful and obedient, but also in doing that in some really challenging contexts. And, and that's relevant to us today, even as we can think about thriving institutions, but also recognize, rec- recognize challenging times, um, for the Quaker sort of church and the Friends Movement and also, Mm -hmm. you know, can challenging times for higher education. And so um, he continues to be inspiring, I think, for thinking about how do we deal with um, complex situations today in a faithful way. So absolutely. He was a human Mm -hmm. who said yes to God Mm -hmm. and he would be absolutely appalled that we were talking about him. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we should draw it short then, not make him roll in his grave too much. So Julie, thank you so much for this book and sharing about it and for coming on the podcast today. Yes. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. This video podcast is a production of George Fox Digital. To find more material like this, you can subscribe to George Fox Talks on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Our team really appreciates your feedback in the form of likes, comments, and reviews, and we'd really love to hear what you think. To sign up for our weekly email list and to keep up to date with the latest episodes and publications, you can check us out on the web at georgefox.edu talks. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.